Hello everybody, hope you're doing well. Welcome to Triarius's Wargaming Book Club. So today I want to share two books with you about warfare in colonial America. Now, one rule set that I'm pretty interested in picking up, and it's pretty interesting to me how popular it's gotten, is muskets and tomahawks conflicts, but the heart of the uh, the heart of the muskets and tomahawks kind of concept is based on sort of colonial American frontier warfare, I guess you could say. So it's kind of interesting, and the original muskets and tomahawks rulebook was solely focused on the French and Indian War, um, parallel to the Seven Years War in Europe. And one of the reasons why it's kind of fascinating to me that this kind of rule set has really picked up, people are buying miniatures and gaming the French and Indian Wars, is that those wars kind of happened in my backyard, like literally happened in my backyard. In uh, elementary school and fourth grade, we do kind of a, our state history is one of the big segments that we do. And we watch this movie, Northwest Passage uh, in fourth grade. <laughs> I'll kill you. I'll kill you, Rogers, and I'll eat your head too. <laughs> no, 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 Rogers, no, no, no. So, yeah, as you can see, there's probably no way that movie would be shown in any kind of school today. Um, it's pretty, uh, you know, they just, that movie is about Rogers Rangers raid on St. Francis, which was like a Abenaki village, kind of even like a refugee camp almost in Canada. The Abenaki have basically been driven out of, you know, what's now the United States. And they're kind of taking refuge uh, with the French in Canada. And basically that raid, they went up and just like slaughtered, um, you know, Native Americans in a village. So not exactly, you know, a politically correct movie. But, you know, in the fourth grade when we watched it, uh, that movie just really fired my imagination. Because, you know, they're off on this adventure, like canoeing and camping in the woods. And, you know, that happened, you know, right by where I live. And what I will do as the kind of year progresses, uh, I'm gonna be doing some on-scene, uh, on-site videos of different French and Indian War locations uh, and also American Revolution and War of 1812 stuff because that all happened, you know, right where I live basically. Right now there's kind of too many tourists out and crazy people yelling and stuff, so I can't really film. Uh, but I'm going to go get out there and, you know, film some stuff. I think you'll find it interesting if you're interested in the muskets and tomahawks. So I can hear you saying, Triarius, this is a book club. Where the heck are the books that you wanted to talk about? So the first book I wanted to bring up is this one. Captors and Captives. The 1704 French and Indian Raid on Deerfield. So Deerfield is a town in Massachusetts and at the time in 1704 it was right on the kind of frontier of the time and you know we talk about the French and Indian War as one war so that was like the last French and Indian War when the French are kind of kicked out of America the American continent um, you know, at least in the north, I guess the Louisiana Purchase was still there. But, uh, you know, there have been a lot of wars between the English colonists and Native Americans before that. And also, you know, the French were getting in on the action. So I think the 1704 raid was during what was called Queen Anne's War. So that is just a really great book. Um, 
detailing what these kind of raiding, the, you know, this raiding warfare was like. And it's highly relevant, even though it's not quite the exact period, you know, of the French and Indian War, the big one. Uh, this raid on Deerfield, you know, this was a huge event. And it really talks about how the raids were planned. You know, it gives a really good perspective from the English side and also the French and Indian side. You know, what the raids were like, what happened when a village was raided, what it was like for the captives to be transported. Um, so that is really great material for scenarios that you're going to run because it gives you such a vivid impression of what these kind of ra this raiding warfare was like. The other thing that's really great about this book is it really um, gives great information on the kind of bigger political situation situation at the time. So a lot of this time, you know, it's the French and Indian War, not like the Indian and French War. And, you know, it's kind of a continuation of the Seven Years War in, you know, the American continent. So the focus there is always on this conflict between the English and the French. And the Native Americans are kind of like just the French allies. What this book really makes clear is that the Indians uh, really had their own, you know, reasons for going to war. They weren't just French allies. They had, you know, they were allied with the French, some tribes, but they had their real own agendas that they were trying to fulfill by allying with the French. You know, they actually had, you know, they weren't just French lackeys. They had specific goals that they were trying to achieve during that war. And, you know, not all the Native Americans did side with the French. The Iroquois, for example, were British allies and would be British allies during the American Revolution as well. So, again, that book is Captors and Captives, about the 1704 French and Indian raid on Deerfield. I highly recommend you picking it up. And, again, that, the raid on Deerfield is kind of interesting to me. I don't live in Massachusetts, and I'm glad that I don't, um, but the... Indian Raiders actually passed uh, right by where I live now um, and, uh, you know, heading south, um, you know, using the rivers. And one of the kind of interesting things is actually in my state, a lot of those Native American movement, um, you know, the way they would move through the landscape, that is where our roads are today uh, in the river valleys. Because, you know, that's where the easy way to get through the mountains is in the valleys and you know, those kind of patterns don't change. Um, and yeah, when I, uh, you know, I used to work in for state government and, you know, if we were trying to, if we were doing anything that would disturb the soil in uh, certain river valleys, we'd have to have a full archeological review because there are so many Native American sites, you know, along these rivers. And, uh, you know, I live next to this giant lake, um, which was heavily utilized by the Native Americans for not only transportation, but fish, you know, it had a massive fishery at the time. So a lot of like Native American settlement activity on the lake, you know, we had one project that, you know, we couldn't even do it because the archeological uh, significance of the site was so great. We, you know, we weren't basically allowed to disturb the soil at all. So the second book I have for you and the final book is this one. Stark, The Life and Wars of John Stark, French and Indian War Ranger, Revolutionary War General. So General Stark is kind of the forgotten general of the American Revolution. You know, he's kind of left out of all the big histories, and it's kind of a total injustice to him. And this book is kind of trying to set the record straight. So... But not only is it about him, it gives just such a great uh, overview of the French and Indian War and also the American Revolution. But the focus is really on these kind of raiding, small-scale warfare in the wilderness. So John Stark, he is from New Hampshire, and he was a, uh, you know, he was like a frontier boy. The, by that time, the frontier was now further north than Deerfield. So he grew up on the frontier and he's part of this generation of people, of English settlers who are also, you know, kind of part Indian culturally. And that's not quite what I mean, but they grew up in the woods. So they were natural born woodsmen. Um, whereas previous generations of English settlers, the wood, you know, the woods, the North woods was like a hostile place. 
to his generation. He's like the first generation that is at home at the woods. And they knew, you know, he was friends with uh, Native Americans and kind of learned, you know, some of their skills. So that's what, uh, you know, he was part of Rogers Rangers, which if you're into the French and Indian Wars, I'm sure you know about. But they were the first kind of, well, maybe not quite the first, but they were really, um, you know, accustomed to woods fighting. And they're kind of trying to fight the Native Americans, uh, you know, in the same way that the Native Americans fought. And they were highly valued by the British uh, during the French and Indian War. And, you know, one of those big myths out there is that the Redcoats could not adapt to the, you know, the forested landscape of North America. That's totally not true. The British were, and certain specific generals too, were highly aware of the, uh, you know, Native Amer the North American woodland conditions. They had lots of their own ranger units. Uh, you know, the Saratoga campaign, they adapt their uniforms for the North Woods and everything. So the British were not total idiots uh, tromping around like they might seem all the time. Um, but that book gives first a great overview of a lot of the battles in the French and Indian War that John Stark was involved with. And again, there are a lot of like raiding type of battles. Uh, and he, you know, he's also in the big battles too, you know, big, they're pretty small compared to European battles. And there's just so much interesting history there. Like, I think there's this like Connecticut regiment of militia that just get, keeps on getting slaughtered in the French and Indian War. They're blundering around uh, and they just, at every turn, take like the most, the maximum casualties due to their, you know, whatever bad luck or incompetence, I can't quite remember, but there's so many fascinating details. Um, and this guy was there for it all. By the time of the American Revolution, this guy was one of the most experienced general, you know, military men uh, who was on the American side, on the rebel side, or patriots if you prefer, you know, depending on what your, your viewpoint is on the, you know, the American rebels there. But he was one of the most experienced guys working for the Americans. And basically Congress treated him like hot garbage. Um, same with Benedict Arnold, too. Um, so Stark was actually there for all the, you know, big early war stuff. You know, he was there in Boston. He was in a lot of the big campaigns. He was there with Washington when Benedict Arnold turned traitor. And he actually was part of the, uh, you know, tribunal that condemned Benedict Arnold. So he's actually a really fascinating fascinating guy he is like a tough man made out of iron and he was he, you know his main claim to fame is that he was the uh the main general at the battle of bennington which is the biggest uh you know um, revolutionary war battle fought in my state and it was like a pretty important one in the saratoga campaign i mean it's not like the biggest battle in the world but it was important so general stark uh despite all of his great qualities Basically, due to Congress's, you know, political machinations, he was never promoted to what he should have been. And that's because Congress was promoting generals basically based on their, on political reasons, not on, you know, military reasons. And, you know, maybe Congress was right to do that. You know, they're making what they think are the best political decisions for the fate of the nation. That basically ended up screwing John Stark uh, because he was not politically valuable to promote, even though he was extremely competent general. And, you know, basically the society at that time was an honor bound society. Basically him, him having inferiors promoted above him was basically an affront to his personal honor. So it was, you know, it was personal. These other people being promoted, like random French aristocrats would show up and be promoted. And, you know, Lafayette turned out to be good. A lot of, a lot of the ones who turned up were not good. So these random people being promoted above him was just too much for him to take. So he basically was like, you know, take it or leave it. You're not going to give me the position that you know, my honor demands, I'm done. So they didn't, and he basically, you know, 
became a grouchy old guy. And, you know, whether this, that was the right thing or not to do, um, you know, maybe it wasn't. But to him, Congress was basically giving him a really personal fuck you. Congress was basically giving him a really personal fuck you. So, you know, he kind of decided to wash his hands of the whole thing. He still supported the rebel cause, but he was not going to be a general in their army. So I went off on a kind of long tangent about John Stark. The book itself is really great in giving you lots of details on the battles, on what kind of also day-to-day -day life was like for the soldiers, a lot of what their duties were. One thing I didn't know, for example, is they actually had, uh, you know, in this part of the world, had those continental soldiers building tons of roads through the wilderness um, that didn't exist before. And, you know, it talks a lot about what the skirmishing warfare in the Northwoods was like. So I would highly recommend picking that one up. Right now I'm teaching American history, which, you know, I wasn't super pumped on teaching American history. And then, you know, I got back in the colonial stuff and that, you know, I'd kind of, that had been kind of laying latent with me. And now I'm like, wow, this colonial stuff is so interesting. It's kind of brought up a lot of stuff that I wasn't thinking about before because my mind has been in other places. So I hope you like this video. I'm planning on doing more kind of book club stuff. Hopefully kind of shorter than this one, actually. But I hope you liked it and take care.